in the third <coughs> excuse me in the third year of the drought God said to Elijah three years we can see what the damage has been done in one season after a drier season last year <coughs> We've had hardly any rain this year. Everything looks dry and yellow, and if it's like our lawn, it looks pretty dead. We moved to Karenport in 2000, and it was either 2001 and one or 2002, you people probably know, that we didn't get any rain all summer. Storm clouds would gather, it would thunder and it would lightning, but then it would clear up without raining. We'd never experienced anything like that before. What do you do when something that you need, that you very badly need, doesn't happen? Psalm 65.5, the psalmist proclaims, You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God our Savior. You are the hope of everyone on earth. What do we do when we pray and pray and pray and we still don't get rain? What do we do with scriptures like Psalm 65 verse 9 where it says, the psalmist writes, you take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile. The river of God has plenty of water. It provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordained it so. Paul uses God's provision to show what God's really like when he is speaking, and you'll find this in the book of Acts, and he said, God has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. God shows his kindness by providing rain. But what about when he doesn't? What do we do? Elijah goes to King Ahab and says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Now, I need to make a correction from last week. Last week I showed you the, the first kings of Israel and I forgot one. Got home on Sunday and thought, how did I forget Saul? I said that David was the first king. So I just wanted to make sure that I got that right. And Ahab is the seventh king when the kingdoms divide. And last week we talked about idolatry in Israel. The people worship the gods of the nations around them even although God alone was to be the Lord their God. And in particular, they worshipped Baal, the god of Ahab's wife, Jezebel. Baal was an idol, so he was a god that they could see. Baal was called the rider of the clouds, the one who sent rain and blessed the earth with abundant crops, the one who helped them prosper. So the people welcomed Jezebel's god, and they built Baal his own temple. But they didn't totally reject God. They just offered their sacrifices and worshipped both. Doesn't that make sense? If you're a farmer, you want to make sure you're going to get a good crop. So you do all it takes. You say your morning prayers, you commit your day to God, and then you check your horoscope to see what you should plant that day or what you should do. A friend said to me once, and this is what he said, I'm a Christian, but why wouldn't I try to get all the help I can get? I pray to God, but I also carry crystals. I read my horoscope, and I light candles to a Buddha in my house. I try to cover all the bases. That is not the way it works. God stops Ahab and Jezebel and the people in their tracks. Baal promises rain, and God says no. There will be no rain, and there isn't. In the meantime, he miraculously provides for, Eli for Elijah while Israel and the nations around them dry up. God is in control. And now three years later, God says to, Eli to e Elijah, tell Ahab, I will soon send rain. Who will send rain? In God's time, according to God's word, there will be rain. 
Now I expect through that period of time, Elijah and his prophets and even the people were praying to Baal for rain. And Elijah hunts for, or um, Ahab hunts for Elijah during that time and he can't find him. Now where we pick up the story, Ahab and his servant are searching for water to keep their animals alive. And when Ahab meets Elijah, he calls him a troublemaker. It always surprises me when I read these stories. These are mighty kings, and yet they are powerless, often powerless before God's prophets. Instead of arresting Elijah, throwing him in prison, or maybe even worse, Elijah is in control. God is with him. And it's like the king doesn't matter, and we hear very little of the king until the very end of the story. Elijah says to the king, I haven't made trouble for Israel. You and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands. You've followed the Baals. He says, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring the 400 prophets of Baal and the 400 the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And the king does. Calls the people together. And Elijah talks to them. And he exposes their idolatry. He says to them, how long will you waver between two options? That verse hit me this week. How long will you waver between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. You've got to make a choice. And Jesus says the very same thing. You can't serve two gods. They're powerful, challenging words. And this verse, as I've read it over this week, just shows the sad state of their hearts. I think it is such a sad verse. The people don't respond. They say nothing. They're undecided. They won't commit. They're weighing their options. But God has a plan to display his mighty power and his great love for his people. And Elijah goes into action. And Elijah sets up a contest between himself and God and the 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah sets the conditions. He says each side will build an altar. They will put wood on the altar. They will put a bull, a bull on the altar. But you don't set the sacrifice on fire. And he says, then you call upon the name of, the, of your God. And I'll call on, on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. The people agree. That sounds fair. The very fact that they agree to that, what does that say about them? Notice that Elijah gives the prophets of Baal the advantage. He says the first one who answers by fire is God, and then he lets the prophets of Baal go first. They're not even doing this at the same time. The prophets of Baal go first. And he gives them plenty of time. They cry out to Baal to send fire, and they dance, and they shout, and they cut themselves with sword and swords and nothing happens and time passes and it's now into the afternoon and then mid-afternoon and Elijah taunts them and he, make, he says to them maybe your God is thinking and busy and traveling and can't hear you maybe he's asleep and you need to wake him up and they shout louder and still nothing happens finally as evening approaches Elijah calls the people near, and he takes his time. And as I read that, it was like he's telling the people their story as he works. It's like he's telling them who they are, who their God is, and what God has done for them in the past. Elijah repairs the altar of God that is sitting in ruins on Mount Carmel because it isn't being used. And he uses 12 stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. You may remember that when, when, uh, when Joshua leads Israel through the Jordan River on dry ground to the Promised Land, many, many, many years earlier, God commands them to take 12 stones, 12 rocks out of the river and to, to, to build an altar that is never to be used as an altar, but it's to build, be built as a remembrance and a reminder 
a memorial of what God has done for them. And now, years later, Elijah uses 12 stones to build the altar, to remind the people how God saved them out of slavery in Egypt and how God led them and was with them. He made a covenant with them that he would be their God and they would be his people and he provided for them and he brought them safely to this land. And like a priest, Elijah lays the wood on the altar and then he lays the offering, the bull, on top. And then he does something surprising. He digs a deep trench around the wall and he tells the people to, for, to dump four large jars of water over the wood, over the bull, and over the whole altar. And then he has them repeat it two more times. Twelve large jugs of water. Everything is soaked. Water is running over the wall, over the offering, over the wood, over the stones, and into the trench. It's making it almost impossible to start a fire. And yet I believe that each action that Elijah does is, do is done in complete faith and in complete confidence that the Lord his God will act. And as the time of the evening sacrifice arrives, Eli Elijah prays to God. And he doesn't shout. And he doesn't jump around to try to get God's attention. He knows that God hears him. He simply confesses who God is. And he asks God to reveal himself to his people so they also will know once again who is the true and living God. He prays, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And as he prays, fire explodes from the sky onto the altar, and the, the majesty and the power of the living God is on full display as the bull and the wood and the stones and the soil and even the water are consumed by the fire of God. God affirms his word through Elijah and he accepts Elijah's sacrifice and he reveals himself to the people in a mighty, mighty way. He is the one true God. He is the one who rides across the ancient heavens. His mighty voice thunders from the sky. It's God's strength is mighty in the heavens. God is God of all gods. He is king of all kings and he is Lord of all lords and Lord of heaven and earth. And the people watch first in amazement and in awe, and then they fall to the ground crying out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then they follow Elijah's instructions. And they take the prophets of Baal, and they put them to death. And there's a new commitment. And there's a new fresh start. And with that, now is the time for rain. And Elijah falls on his knees, and in faith, he prays for God to keep his promise, to do what God said he would do, and to reveal his power again. And six times, Elijah sends his prophet to the peak of the hill and says, Look out, do you see any, do you see any clouds? Six times, the prophet comes back and says he sees nothing. And the seventh time, there's a very small cloud the size of a man's hand, and he, Elijah immediately turns, and this is the first time in a, all day that he's talked to Ahab. He says to Ahab, hitch up your chariot, get home before the rain stops you. And Ahab obeys, and Elijah starts running, and he runs so fast in the power of the Lord that he gets to Jezreel ahead of King Ahab. Like I said, I've been so blessed as I've read these scriptures and prepared today. What an amazing God we have. 
We have a God who makes himself known to, a, to us, a God who is with us through even the most difficult of times, and we are going to see even more of that in the, next, in the next weeks as I continue on at the end of the month. These sh stories show us that God knows what's happening in our world. There's nothing that is beyond his control. We can place our hope and our trust in the Lord our God. And I was challenged as I read this chapter. And I prayed, oh God, what forms of idolatry do I, or do we get caught up in today? What are we putting ahead of you? Who do we put our trust and our faith and our hope in instead of God? We don't bow down to a, an image made of gold, but idolatry takes shape in many different ways. What do we put our trust in instead of God? Money, security, the weather, ourselves. Idolatry is putting our trust in something or someone other than God or along with God. And as I prayed, it made me squirm. One thing that came to my mind is, we're getting older, and I often wonder, are we going to have enough money for the future? when we both finally are not working anymore. And what should I do to make sure that we do? Who and what am I putting my trust in? And again, I'm not saying that e any of these things in and of themselves are bad. It's when we put them above God and put our trust in them. When does money and happiness and comfort and security and things become an idol? We can't serve two gods. And Elijah challenged the people. If the Lord is God, follow him. And he meant, commit your whole life, holy, holy to God. No matter what happens, no matter if you're praying for something and you don't have an answer to prayer, no matter if you're praying for someone and they die, no matter if it looks like our children have walked away from the Lord, no matter what it is we're praying for, we put God first no matter what the outcome is or what it seems to be. We've committed ourselves wholly to God and we're not going to go to some outside source or, or, or something else that is maybe in the spiritual somewhere, but it's not God to try to get an answer instead. In these times we live, finances and our future can seem uncertain. And I encourage all of us today, as I've been challenged and as I've been encouraged, may we turn our eyes to the living God. May we commit ourselves wholly, even more wholly to God, no matter what. May we be wise in the decisions that we make and what we do. But may we know that there is one who loves us, who is with us, and is there with us and will care for us and be with us no matter what we face. And may we be able to say, no matter what happens, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Let's pray together. Thank you, O oh God, for your word. Lord, I thank you how that your word challenges us challenges us to look at ourselves. And I know that I don't always like what I see when you poke your finger in me. But my desire, oh God, above all else, and I, and I pray it's all of our desires, is that I want to put you first. I want to commit myself day by day by day wholly and completely to you. Lord, like the psalm says, when even though earth seems to be falling away, God is that solid rock on which we stand. And I thank you, O oh God, that we can put our hope and our trust in you. And I thank you, Lord, that you know, you know what's happening. Sometimes we may think you don't, <laughs> the way things go, but you do. And nothing, nothing will go beyond your plans, your purposes. 
what you are doing as our world moves forward to that one day when you will come again and you will take us all to be with you. You are so good. You are so good. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness shown towards us. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation so rich and free, for forgiveness of sins, for the cleansing of your blood, for the Holy Spirit who fills us and shows us the way and shows us where things where we aren't quite right with the Lord continues to work in us and continues to transform us thank you for this next week ahead of us and Lord as we go into it I thank you that you lead the way and I pray again oh God that we may have opportunities to share this wonderful good news with those around us Lord that others may come to know, to know you in a, in a deeper greater way or maybe for the first time Give us those opportunities, I pray. And I pray that as you have blessed us, that we may be a blessing to others. In the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>